Section 1 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5. By Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 35. Henry IV, Protestant King, 1589-1593. to Part 1. On the 2nd of August, 1589, in the morning, upon his arrival in his quarters at Meudon, Henry of Navarre was saluted by the Protestants of the King of France. They were about five thousand in an army of forty thousand men. When at ten o'clock he entered the camp of the Catholics at Saint-Cloud, three of their principal leaders, Marshal d'Aumont and sires Dumière and de Givry, immediately acknowledged him unconditionally, as they had done the day before, at the deathbed of Henry the Third, and they at once set to work to conciliate to him the noblesse of Champagne, Picardy, and Ile-de-France. Sir, said Givry, you are the king of the brave. You will be deserted by none but dastards. End quote but the majority of the catholic leaders received him with such expressions as quote, better die than endure a huguenot king end quote. one of them francis do formally declared to him that the time had come for him to choose between the insignificance of a king of navarre and the grandeur of a king of france if he pretended to the crown he must first of all abjure henry firmly rejected these threatening entreaties and left their camp with an urgent recommendation to them to think of it well before bringing dissension into the royal army and the royal party which were protecting their privileges their property and their lives against the league on returning to his quarters he noticed the arrival of marshal de biron who pressed him to lay hands without delay upon the crown of france in order to guard it and save it but in the evening of that day and on the morrow at the numerous meetings of the lords to deliberate upon the situation the ardent catholics renewed their demand for the exclusion of henry from the throne if he did not at once abjure and for referring the election of a king to the states-general biron himself proposed not to declare henry king but to recognize him merely as captain-general of the army pending his abjuration Arlet de Sancy vigorously maintained the cause of the Salic law and the hereditary rights of monarchy. Biron took him aside and said, quote, I had hitherto thought that you had sense. Now I doubt it. If, before securing our own position with the King of Navarre, we completely establish his, he will no longer care for us. The time is come for making our terms. If we let the occasion escape us, we shall never recover it. End quote. Quote, what are your terms asked sancy if it please the king to give me the countship of perigord i shall be his for ever sancy reported this conversation to the king who promised biron what he wanted though king of france for but two days past henry the fourth had already perfectly understood and steadily taken the measure of the situation he was in a great minority throughout the country as well as the army and he would have to deal with public passions worked by his foes for their own ends and with the personal pretensions of his partisans he made no mistake about these two facts and he allowed them great weight but he did not take for the ruling principle of his policy and for his first rule of conduct the plan of alternate concessions to the different parties and of continually humouring personal interests he set his thoughts higher upon the general and natural interests of france as he found her and saw her they resolved themselves in his eyes into the following great points maintenance of the hereditary rights of monarchy preponderance of catholics in the government peace between catholics and protestants and religious liberty for protestants with him these points became the law of his policy and his kingly duty as well as the nation's right he proclaimed them in the first words that he addressed to the lords and principal personages of state assembled around him quote, you all know said he what orders the late king my predecessor gave me and what he enjoined upon me with his dying breath it was chiefly to maintain my subjects catholic or protestant in equal freedom until a council canonical general or national had decided this great dispute I promised him to perform faithfully that which he bade me, and I regard it as one of my first duties to be as good as my word. 
I have heard that some who are in my army feel scruples about remaining in my service unless I embrace the Catholic religion. No doubt they think me weak enough for them to imagine that they can force me thereby to abjure my religion and break my word. I am very glad to inform them here, in presence of you all, that I would rather this were the last day of my life than take any step which might cause me to be suspected of having dreamt of renouncing the religion that I sucked in with my mother's milk, before I have been better instructed by a lawful counsel, to whose authority I bow in advance. Let him who thinks so ill of me get him gone as soon as he pleases i lay more store by a hundred good frenchmen than by two hundred who could harbour sentiments so unworthy besides though you should abandon me i should have enough of friends left to enable me without you and to your shame with the sole assistance of their strong arms to maintain the rights of my authority but were i doomed to see myself deprived of even that assistance still the god who has preserved me from my infancy as if by his own hand to sit upon the throne will not abandon me i nothing doubt that he will uphold me where he has placed me not for love of me but for the salvation of so many souls who pray without ceasing for his aid and for whose freedom he has deigned to make use of my arm you know that I am a Frenchman and the foe of all duplicity. For the seventeen years that I have been King of Navarre, I do not think that I have ever departed from my word. I beg you to address your prayers to the Lord on my behalf, that he may enlighten me in my views, direct my purposes, bless my endeavors and in case i commit any fault or fail in any one of my duties, for I acknowledge that I am a man like any other, Pray him to give me grace, that I may correct it, and to assist me in all my goings. End quote. On the 4th of August, 1589, an official manifesto of Henry the Fourth's confirmed the ideas and words of this address. On the same day, in the camp at St. Cloud, the majority of the princes, dukes, lords, and gentlemen present in the camp expressed their full adhesion to the accession and the manifesto of the king, promising him, quote, service and obedience against rebels and enemies who would usurp the kingdom, end quote. Two notable leaders, the Duke of Epernon amongst the Catholics and the Duke of La Tremoille amongst the Protestants, refused to join in this adhesion the former saying that his conscience would not permit him to serve a heretic king the latter alleging that his conscience forbade him to serve a prince who engaged to protect catholic idolatry they withdrew d'epernon into angoumois and saint onge taking with him six thousand foot and twelve thousand horse and la tremoille into poitou with nine battalions of reformers they had an idea of attempting both of them to set up for themselves independent principalities three contemporaries sully la force and the bastard of angouleme bear witness that henry the fourth was deserted by as many huguenots as catholics the french royal army was reduced it is said to one half as a make-weight saucy prevailed upon the swiss to the number of twelve thousand and two thousand german auxiliaries not only to continue in the service of the new king but to wait six months for their pay as he was at the moment unable to pay them from the fourteenth to the twentieth of august in ile de france in picardy in normandy in auvergne in champagne in burgundy in anjou in poitou in languedoc in orleanes and in touraine a great number of towns and districts joined in the determination of the royal army the last instance of such adherence had a special importance at the time of henry the third's rupture with the league the parliament of paris had been split in two the royalists had followed the king to tours the partisans of the league had remained at paris after the accession of henry the fourth the parliament of tours with the president achille d'arlet as its head increased from day to day and soon reached two hundred members whilst the parliament of paris or brisson parliament as it was called from its leader's name had only sixty-eight left brisson on undertaking the post actually thought it right to take the precaution of protesting privately making a declaration in the presence of notaries quote, that he so acted by constraint only and that he shrank from any rebellion against his king and sovereign lord end quote. 
it was indeed on the ground of the heredity of the monarchy and by virtue of his own proper rights that henry the fourth had ascended the throne and m poisson says quite correctly in his learned histoire du reine d'henri iv page twenty nine second edition eighteen sixty two quote, the manifesto of henry the fourth as its very name indicates was not a contract settled between the noblesse in camp at st cloud and the claimant it was a solemn and reciprocal acknowledgment by the noblesse of henry's rights to the crown and by henry of the nation's political civil and religious rights the engagements entered into by henry were only what were necessary to complete the guarantees given for the security of the rights of catholics as touching the succession to the throne the signataries themselves say that all they do is to maintain and continue the law of the land there was in fifteen eighty nine an unlawful pretender to the throne of france and that was cardinal charles de bourbon younger brother of antony de bourbon king of navarre and consequently uncle of henry the fourth sole representative of the elder branch under henry the third the cardinal had thrown in his lot with the league and after the murder of guise henry the third had by way of precaution ordered him to be arrested and detained him in confinement at chinon where he still was when henry the third was in his turn murdered on becoming king the far-sighted henry the fourth at once bethought him of his uncle and of what he might be able to do against him the cardinal was at chinon in the custody of sieur de chavigny quote, a man of proved fidelity says de Thou, but by this time old and blind end quote. henry the fourth wrote to duplessis mornay appointed quite recently governor of the saumur quote, bidding him at any price says madame de mornay to get cardinal de bourbon away from chinon where he was without sparing anything even to the whole of his property because he would incontinently set himself up for king if he could obtain his release henry the fourth was right as early as the seventh of august the duke of mayenne had an announcement made to the parliament of paris and written notice sent to all the provincial governors quote, that in the interval until the states-general could be assembled he urged them all to unite with him in rendering with one accord to their catholic king that is to say cardinal de bourbon the obedience that was due to him End quote the cardinal was in fact proclaimed king under the name of charles x and eight months afterwards on the fifth of march fifteen ninety the parliament of paris issued a decree quote, recognizing charles x as true and lawful king of france duplessis mornay ill though he was had understood and executed without loss of time the orders of king henry going bail himself for the promises that had to be made and for the sums that had to be paid to get the cardinal away from the governor of chinon he succeeded and had the cardinal removed to fontenay le comte in poitou quote, under the custody of sieur de la boulet governor of that place whose valour and fidelity were known to him end quote. Quote, that said henry the fourth on receiving the news is one of the greatest services i could have had rendered me m duplessis does business most thoroughly End quote. on the ninth of may fifteen ninety not three months after the decree of the parliament of paris which had proclaimed him true and lawful king of france cardinal de bourbon still a prisoner died at fontenay aged sixty seven a few weeks before his death he had written to his nephew henry the fourth a letter in which he recognized him as his sovereign the league was more than ever dominant in paris henry the fourth could not think of entering there before recommencing the war in his own name he made villeroy who after the death of henry the third had rejoined the duke of mayenne an offer of an interview in the bois de boulogne to see if there were no means of treating for peace mayenne would not allow villeroy to accept the offer quote, he had no private quarrel he said with the king of navarre whom he highly honoured and who to his certain knowledge had not looked with approval upon his brother's death but any appearance of negotiation would cause great distrust amongst their party and they would not do anything that tended against the rights of king charles the tenth renouncing all idea of negotiation henry the fourth set out on the eighth of august from st cloud after having told off his army in three divisions two were ordered to go and occupy picardy and champagne and the king kept with him only the third about six thousand strong 
he went and laid the body of henry the third in the church of saint corneille at compiegne took Mulan and several small towns on the banks of the seine and oise and propounded for discussion with his officers the question of deciding in which direction he should move towards the loire or the seine on tours or on rouen he determined in favour of normandy he must be master of the ports in that province in order to receive there the reinforcements which had been promised him by queen elizabeth of england and which she did send him in september fifteen eighty nine forming a corps of from four to five thousand men scots and english quote, aboard of thirteen vessels laden with twenty two thousand pounds sterling in gold and seventy thousand pounds of gunpowder three thousand cannon-balls and corn biscuits wine and beer together with wool and even shoes end quote. they arrived very opportunely for the close of the campaign but too late to share in henry the fourth's first victory that series of fights around the castle of arc which in the words of an eye-witness the duke of angouleme quote, was the first gate whereby henry entered upon the road of his glory and good fortune end quote after making a demonstration close to rouen henry the fourth learning that the duke of mayenne was advancing in pursuit of him with an army of twenty five thousand foot and eight thousand horse thought it imprudent to wait for him and run the risk of being jammed between forces so considerable and the hostile population of a large city so he struck his camp and took the road to dieppe in order to be near the coast and the reinforcements from queen elizabeth some persons even suggested to him that in case of mishap he might go thence and take refuge in england but at this prospect biron answered quote, there is no king of france out of france end quote. and henry the fourth was of biron's opinion at his arrival before dieppe he found as governor there aymar de chastes a man of wits and honour a very moderate catholic and very strongly in favour of the party of policists under henry the third he had expressly refused to enter the league saying to villars who pressed him to do so quote, i am a frenchman and you yourself will find out that the spaniard is the real head of the league End quote. he had organized at dieppe four companies of burgess guards consisting of catholics and protestants and he assembled about him to consider the affairs of the town a small council in which protestants had the majority as soon as he knew on the twenty sixth of august that the king was approaching dieppe he went with the principal inhabitants to meet him and presented to him the keys of the place saying quote, i come to salute my lord and hand over to him the government of this city end quote. Quote, ventre saint gris answered henry the fourth i know nobody more worthy of it than you are end quote. the dieppes overflowed with felicitations quote, no fuss my lads said henry all i want is your affections good bread good wine and good hospitable faces End quote. when he entered the town quote, he was received says a contemporary chronicler with loud cheers by the people and what was curious but exhilarating was to see the king surrounded by close upon six thousand armed men himself having but a few officers at his left hand End quote he received at dieppe assurance of the fidelity of la verune governor of caen whither in fifteen eighty nine according to henry the third's order that portion of the parliament of normandy which would not submit to the yoke of the league at rouen had removed caen having set the example saint lo coutances and carentan likewise sent deputies to dieppe to recognize the authority of henry the fourth but henry had no idea of shutting himself up inside dieppe after having carefully inspected the castle citadel harbour fortifications and outskirts of the town he left there five hundred men in garrison supported by twelve or fifteen hundred well-armed burgesses and went and established himself personally in the old castle of arc standing since the eleventh century upon a barren hill below in the burg of arc he sent biron into cantonments with his regiment of swiss and the companies of french infantry and he lost no time in having large fosses dug ahead of the burg in front of all the approaches enclosing within an extensive line of circumvallation both burg and castle all the king's soldiers and the peasants that could be picked up in the environs worked night and day whilst they were at work henry wrote to countess corisande de gramont his favourite at that time quote, my dear heart 
It is a wonder I am alive with such work as I have. God have pity upon me and show me mercy, blessing my labors, as he does in spite of a many folks. I am well, and my affairs are going well. I have taken U. The enemy who are double me just now thought to catch me there, but I drew off towards Dieppe, and I await them in a camp that I am fortifying. To-morrow will be the day when I shall see them, and I hope, with God's help, that if they attack me they will find they have made a bad bargain. The bearer of this goes by sea. The wind and my duties make me conclude. This ninth of September, in the trenches at Arc. All was finished when the scouts of Mayenne appeared. But Mayenne also was an able soldier. He saw that the position the king had taken and the works he had caused to be thrown up rendered a direct attack very difficult. He found means of bearing down upon Dieppe another way, and of placing himself, says the latest historian of Dieppe, M. Vitet, between the king and the town, quote, hoping to cut off the king's communications with the sea, divide his forces, deprive him of his reinforcements from England, and finally surround him and capture him, end quote, as he had promised the leaguers of Paris, who were already talking of the iron cage in which the Bernese would be sent to them. Quote, Henry the Fourth, continues M. Vitet, felt some vexation at seeing his forecasts checkmated by Mayenne's manoeuvre, and at having had so much earth removed to so little profit. But he was a man of resources, confident as the Gascons are, and with very little of pig-headedness. To change all his plans was with him the work of an instant. Instead of awaiting the foe in his entrenchments, he saw that it was for him to go and feel for them on the other side of the valley, and that on pain of being invested he must not leave the leaguers any exit but the very road they had taken to come. End quote. Having changed all his plans on this new system, Henry breathed more freely. But he did not go to sleep for all that. He was incessantly backwards and forwards from Dieppe to Arc, from Arc to Dieppe, and to the Faubourg du Palais. Mayenne, on the contrary, seemed to have fallen into a lethargy. He had not yet been out of his quarters during the nearly eight and forty hours since he had taken them. On the 17th of September, 1589, in the morning, however, a few hundred light horse were seen putting themselves in motion, scouring the country, and coming to fire their pistols close to the fosses of the royal army. The skirmish grew warm by degrees. Quote, My son, said Marshal de Biron to the young Count of Auvergne, natural son of Charles the Ninth and Mary Touchet, charge, now is the time. End quote the young prince without his hat and his horsemen charged so vigorously that they put the leaguers to the rout killed three hundred of them and returned quietly within their lines by biron's orders without being disturbed in their retreat these partial and irregular encounters began again on the eighteenth and nineteenth of september with the same result the duke of mayenne was nettled and humiliated he had his prestige to recover he decided to concentrate all his forces right on the king's entrenchments, and attack them in front with his whole army. The 20th of September passed without a single skirmish. Henry, having received good information that he would be attacked the next day, did not go to bed. The night was very dark. He thought he saw a long way off in the valley a long line of lighted matches, but there was profound silence and the king and his officers puzzled themselves to decide if they were men or glow-worms. On the 21st, at 5 a.m., the king gave orders for every one to be ready and at his post. He himself repaired to the battlefield. Sitting in a big fosse with all his officers, he had his breakfast brought thither, and was eating with good appetite when a prisoner was brought to him, a gentleman of the League, who had advanced too far whilst making a reconnaissance. Quote, "'Good day, Bella,' said the king, who recognized him laughing. "'Embrace me for your welcome appearance.'" Bella embraced him, telling him that he was about to have down upon him thirty thousand foot and ten thousand horse. Quote, "'Where are your forces?' he asked the king, looking about him. Quote, "'Oh, you don't see them all, Monsieur de Bellin, said Henry. "'You don't reckon the good God and the good right, but they are ever with me.'" End quote. End of section 1